I did it again. It's Barbie season, and it was actively my most hyped film of the year, to the point that I dyed these, these, these jeans, these jeans, pink, um, because apparently it is impossible to find pink jeans in my long boy size. But I am a cis man who grew up in the noughties. I don't have the closest familiarity with the Barbie brand. I needed to bone up before the movie's release. And this is where the BCU comes in. The Barbie Cinematic Universe is Barbie's cinematic aspirations so far, a collection of 42 3D animated productions starting in 2001, predominantly made for DVD release. Yes, there are 42 of these. I watched them all. Why I did this is beyond me. Anyway, this video is going to be long enough as is. I'm going to be ranking these from my least favourite to my favourite. You get it. My least favourite, my number 42 out of 42, is The Barbie Diaries. First off, they decided to go for a completely different production method and art style for this one, and it did not pay off. For some reason, they decided to go with an entirely motion capture production, a la The Polar Express. Why they decided to do this on a straight-to-DVD Barbie budget is beyond me. Everyone is an absolute pick-me in this one, with both me and my roommate screaming our way through Barbie and Kevin getting together. I just did not enjoy this one in the slightest. I was watching these chronologically, and this was the first one I actively disliked. Nothing surpassed it for me. It's only 70 minutes, but it felt so much longer. It's just... those words. Can I count on you? Number 41 is Barbie Presents Thumbelina. This one just doesn't really feel like a Barbie movie to me. Ignoring the fact that Barbie is barely in it, the main character's proportions just don't scream Barbie to me, and the vibes just feel very generic kids movie as opposed to being quintessentially Barbie. So much of this movie is focused around saying that you can convince a capitalist pig to change their ways just by being kind to them. We know this is not true in the slightest in the real world, but that's just so much of this movie. This is made worse when the workers are more active, vengeful villains than the actual capitalists at the head of the corporation, and I just can't with that. I just didn't care for this one, with the iffy messaging really not helping my judgement of the movie. With a hint of whimsy. You smell whimsy? I smell whimsy too! Number 40 is Barbie, Mariposa and the Fairy Princess. No Bibble in this one immediately downgrades it. And we'll get to Bibble. And you, aren't you the most luscious thing a branch ever saw? My issues with this one are predominantly structural, with the villain barely showing up outside of the climax and her plan just kinda happening without any real setup or build up. It's now that I'll mention quite how queer these films are in nearly every one of these things, the levels of romantic tension between the female leads is often far more prominent than between the Barbie and Ken of the film. Here it's between Mariposa and Katiana, who have one particular scene in which they dance together that's just chock full of romantic tension. I'll obviously keep pointing it out as it happens, but my god is it frequent. <laughs> what do you think? Beautiful. Number 39 is Barbie, A Perfect Christmas. A lot of stuff just kind of happens in this one without rhyme or reason. There's no such thing as setup or payoff for a lot of this movie. A lot of stuff is just loaded on these girls, which is just not great storytelling for me. I would also like to question the plane route that the Roberts clan takes. Their journey is from Miami to New York. That's two East Coast locales. They get diverted, thanks to the snow, to Minnesota. I don't understand geography or plane routes, but that one is especially baffling to me. Also, watching a Barbie Christmas movie in July probably weren't ideal conditions for me to particularly enjoy this movie in. This is Santa's workshop! Chelsea, we're in Minnesota. Number 38 is Barbie, Mermaid Power. Much like Thumbelina before it, this one has an environmental message, but doesn't do it especially well. The message here focuses on individual responsibility towards waste ending up in the oceans and our responsibility to clean it up. I don't expect a Barbie movie to fully go into the systemic and corporate causes of this waste, but literally any mention of it would be nice. The end of this movie features an island of rubbish that threatens the mermaids. The solution is to magic it away. We cannot magic away the waste in our oceans. That's not a feasible option for us as a species. The Team Seas project aimed to remove 30 million pounds of waste from the oceans over two years. 33 billion pounds of plastic waste is added per year. Team Seas over two years removed a whole lot less waste than is added per day. 
Messaging like this is incredibly difficult, especially in kids' media, but focusing predominantly on individual responsibility and completely ignoring the actual causes and solutions for our planet's demise is just incredibly frustrating to me. Hmm. Here's an interesting job I can apply for. Tropical beverage taster. I wonder if they'll let me work from home. Ah! Number 37 is Barbie and her sisters in a puppy chase. There's so much dog stuff in this movie, and my brain turned off every time it cut to those puppies. I just do not care for those puppies. They irritate me, frankly. Compared to some earlier films in the BCU release timeline that we will talk about later, this film often doesn't look as good, which is weird. Chronologically, these movies continue to get better and better visually until about this point when it stagnated, sadly. I really don't have much to say about this one. It probably works well with its target audience, but for me, it just didn't connect, unfortunately. <laughs> Number 36 is Barbie, video game hero. The word noob is said within the opening three minutes and then repeated at least once more through the film. I think that speaks volumes as to what this film is. In this one, Barbie designs video games as a hobby. The terminology and depiction may be off in places, but I do think that getting young girls interested in coding and game design can't be a bad thing in the slightest. There's some fun animation style changes from game world to game world. The first world's game style doesn't really do it for me, but the others do, so that's all good. It's always nice to see a Barbie movie taking a creative swing like this. This one also has a really bizarre Just Dance product placement for its climax, which just felt very Emoji Movie-esque. Do you know what's even more awesome? No. What? Just Dance. <laughs> Wanna have some fun? Okay, a tangent. It's now that I would like to talk about Barbie's parents, because Video Game Hero is, I believe, the first time they are mentioned as existing. I think Mom just made some cupcakes. I do not like this. For me, Barbie's parents are meant to be unseen figures of mystery. And this is really only made worse for me when the movies stop being their own things and start becoming specials for the various TV shows in which the parents are characters. And here's the thing, Barbie's parents existing makes the canon of the BCU confusing. We know that Barbie is an actor who plays characters in BCU movies within the BCU from Barbie A Fashion Fairy Tale. But here's the thing, Barbie's parents are not seen or mentioned in any previous out of fictive level BCU movie, despite the fact that it would make sense for them to show up. Their appearance from Video Game Hero onward denote a resetting of the canon, where this is no longer Barbie's role, she's no longer a star, she's now an aspiring actor and musician with a vlog. I'm not the biggest fan of this shift, or the shift in style of movies that we're going to get going forward. On that thread, number 35 is Barbie Princess Adventure. This is the first of the proper Barbie Dreamhouse Adventures specials, and a clear shift in the tone and canon of the BCU going forward. This one is fine, but relies on a pre-existing investment with the characters from the show that I have not seen, and will not see, because I've already put myself through 42 movies, I can't do multiple seasons of TV. This focus on pre-existing characters from the show does ultimately detract from the overall film as it takes time and focus away from Amelia, Amelia being the titular princess. This is the third time the BCU did a Prince and the Pauper story, and for some reason they decided to give the princess's side of the story absolutely no screen time beyond some brief FaceTime check-ins. We only see the story from Barbie's perspective. It just didn't really work for me on a plot level, and overall it was done far better in the other iterations of the story. So insulting! It's like someone doesn't even want me in this movie! Oh. Number 34 is Barbie, Epic Road Trip. This is one of those Netflix interactive things they tried for a bit, and it does an okay job of being one of those things. This one also canonizes Barbie x Ken in this version of the canon, with them kissing in one version of the story, which, ooh, especially when Brooklyn Barbie is right there. And believe me, I tried to stop Barbie x Ken, but was unsuccessful. This one is short, I don't have much to say about it. As an example of those interactive things, it's decent, and there's a good amount of choices throughout. I simply never really cared about these things in the first place. I'm hip. <laughs> in your own way, dear. Number 33 is Barbie in a Christmas Carol. 
This one is just a weird ass concept for a Barbie movie. Why would you choose to adapt a Christmas Carol in Barbie movie form and cast Barbie as Scrooge? The Muppet version did a great job of adapting it whilst keeping it accessible for kids, but death isn't really a concept that the Barbie movies grapple with, nor do they grapple with it here, despite being at the core of the story it's adapting. The spirits aren't closely adapted, with the ghost of Christmas yet to come especially being changed in ways I don't really think works. Why they changed an unspeaking vision of death into a chatty MILF is beyond me. There's some nice ideas in here, but the core concept and execution is so flawed that I struggle to really connect with it on any level. Didn't you hear me calling for you? We're late! The charity Christmas ball starts in like five minutes. All our friends and family are already there, come on! Number 32 is Barbie Spy Squad. I was looking forward to this one from the title alone. A Barbie spy movie? Count me in! As it stands, it's meh. It's often incredibly contrived, though that's more of a core premise problem that I think does hinder it. I do like that the BCU introduces different genres that are typically aimed at boys and men, so it's nice to open up genres like the spy genre to the predominantly female target audience of the BCU. I also think that the villain is one of the lamest and limpest twists that I've ever seen, and the film would either be better served removing the twist and just having a straight up bad guy, or bolstering that twist and emphasising the mystery of the bad guy. As it stands, it just kinda happens and I couldn't care less. Come on, chase me already! Number 31 is Barbie, Big City, Big Dreams. Unlike Spy Squad, which I felt needed a stronger villain, I think this one needed to do away with it. The end of the second act happens with Malibu Barbie being expelled from the school after being framed by the villain for intentionally harming Brooklyn Barbie, with Brooklyn Barbie believing the lie and falling out with Malibu Barbie. This simply doesn't work for me. For one, it's such a sudden shift in the relationship between them that I simply don't buy it. They're such good friends, you know, gal pals. And then suddenly there's an obvious lie and they fall out because Brooklyn loses all semblance of common sense. It would have been so much more interesting to have had Malibu feel inferior to the rest of the students, as well as Brooklyn, as she does for much of the runtime, and have her leave of her own accord to facilitate this plot point. But no, gotta have a villain I guess. I think it's just clunky and just didn't really work for me as well as it could have, with this one plot point really pulling the film down for me. The only labels we believe in are designer. Number 30 is Barbie, Skipper and the Big Babysitting Adventure. This one is the final BCU movie thus far, and with the more recent TV show special output of the BCU not especially working for me, my BCU watching ended on something of a whimper for me unfortunately. The animation here using that TV show style and assets and budget is noticeably worse than some of the stuff that has come before, with a weird amount of goop being thrown at people in this movie just not looking good in the slightest. There are fun 2D animated imagination sequences in this. As I've said previously, I like a creative swing in these things, though these sequences are unfortunately spoiled by interjections from the characters outside of the story, and it distracted from them for me. I also did not need to be called out by this movie. That was uncalled for. Now all those annoying kids will be forced to do adult things, like save for retirement and talk about the demise of DVDs. Number 29 is Barbie and Chelsea, The Lost Birthday. I really enjoy that Chelsea got her own film. After being so sidelined for so long, I'm happy that she got to be at the forefront of her own movie. That being said, the plot does revolve around her feelings about being small and young, which is pretty much the only plot line she ever gets. So whilst I'm happy she got a film, it would have been nice to see her get a more interesting plot. That this mostly happens in Chelsea's imagination isn't the most mind-blowing thing in the world. It is doing pretty much the same thing as the Fluise episode of Bob's Burgers, but it is a fun play on the power of imagination with kids. Overall though, it's still a Dreamhouse Adventures special, which still isn't my favourite style of BCU movie, though thankfully a whole lot less connected to that show than Princess Adventure. Hoi! Name's Arlene, and I'm actually the Assistant Activities Director! Number 28 is Barbie, A Mermaid Tale. This is the point at which this list starts to get a bit arbitrary. There are so many of these movies, and a lot of them are just fine, so it could pretty much go anywhere in the middle of the list. So if you think this is too low, you're probably right. I think making this a movie that involves surfing shows a great deal of confidence in the part of the filmmakers in their ability to do decent water simulation at this point in time. And fair enough to them, it does look pretty solid for the most part. My main issue with this movie is just the fact that when it comes to Oceana, it's just the modern world but underwater. I understand the appeal, but it's just not for me. I'd prefer a more fantastical world under there. As it stands, I found this one to be pretty mid, but I still had a decent time. You mean weird like, whoa, or weird like, 
Whoa! Or weird like, whoa. Number 27 is Barbie as Rapunzel. This is the second BCU movie ever, so I feel like putting it this low may feel sacrilegious. However, I just didn't care for it as much as I could have. I didn't especially vibe with the dragon psychic and their daddy issues in this. In general, I think animal sidekicks, whilst a mainstay of the franchise, tend to be a bit iffy, and this one is absolutely full of them, with Rapunzel herself having two. Goffle's weasel psychic is a lot of fun though. For some reason, there's also the magic paintbrush from Super Mario Sunshine in this. Some odd decisions in this Rapunzel adaptation, to be sure. Please let me go first! I'm doing something! <laughs> cinnamon rolls, 300 strudel, 400 cream puffs, and not to mention a colossal birthday cake. <laughs> Number 26 is Barbie and her sisters in a ponytail. This one is fully for the horse girlies. I'm not a horse girly, so it was never going to be for me, but I can see how it works for that crowd. Obviously, horses and other equine are a staple of the BCU, but this movie really puts them at the forefront like never before. You can tell this is a pure horse girl movie with horse girl movie tropes like Barbie taming the untamable horse, which is a staple of the genre as seen with examples like Aragorn taming that horse in the Two Towers, maybe the biggest horse girl movie of all time. There's some nice creative stuff in here too, like the zoetrope that leads into a nice 2D expositional sequence. This one is pretty good, it's just not made for me and that's okay. Would you call that aubergine? Uh, no? He has a point. That is so not aubergine. Number 25 is Barbie, Dolphin Magic. I'll start by saying I much prefer the dolphin models here to the ones used in the Mermaid Tale films, just a whole lot more palatable for me personally. I also like that them being weirdly coloured is a part of the plot here, with the majority of other BCU films just ignoring that fact. The puppies from the puppy films are here, but aren't given voices, so don't irritate me nearly as much as they did in those ones. This movie has a pretty good romance between Barbie and Isla, with Barbie emotionally saying that she misses Isla at the end before she reappears. It feels especially notable because this is one with Ken in it, and he has fuck all romantic going on with Barbie. It's all between Barbie and Isla. Unfortunately, this relationship isn't really explored in Mermaid Power, as Isla is sidelined, but we cope. Did you say sandwiches? <laughs> no one loves sandwiches more than me. Number 24 is Barbie, Princess Power. A superhero movie feels novel for a Barbie movie, but was probably inevitable considering the cinematic climate of the time. This one is chock full of references to other superhero media, from our Barbie being named Kara after Supergirl, or her doing web shooter hands during the power testing montage, so that's fun. The finale of this movie does drag on a bit, which is surprising for a 70 minute movie. The pieces that comprise it are okay, I just think there are too many of them for it to really come together and not get a bit stale, unfortunately. You mean you write a blog in your bedroom? No. Or on a table at the coffee shop? Number 23 is Barbie in A Mermaid Tale 2. There's less of the modern world but underwater stuff in this movie, which I prefer. The general vibes of this movie are a lot more fantastical and more up my alley, so that helps with the preferring of this one over the first Mermaid Tale. I like Eris's power this time being to make everyone's worst nightmare a reality. That's a fun concept for a witch villain, and certainly more interesting than a lot of the magic has been throughout the BCU. Though these movies aren't too high in my rankings, they do contain some pretty decent action beats that tie in well to the characters in these movies, with both featuring moments of surfing underwater. That's neat and fun. Also, this movie's romance is an enemies to lovers tale between Malia and Kylie, with Kylie being immediately ride or die for Malia when she saves her from the whirlpool. There is not a straight bone in these movies' bodies. You want it? Oh yeah. You better believe it. Number 22 is Barbie in the Nutcracker. The original. The one that would define what these movies are, and it finishes off the lower half of my ranking. Again, this part of the ranking is fairly arbitrary, but this being the first one, it was inevitably going to be bettered over the ensuing 41 movies, and that's not to call this bad. I really appreciate that they got an actual ballet performers to do the motion capture for the ballet sequences. It really works in this movie's favor, and makes some later BCU movies that don't do this look far worse in comparison. As a start to the franchise, this is a strong one. Captain Candy! 
Okay, a slight second tangent now, as we're halfway through, if you'll allow me. I'm only ranking the BCU movies here, meaning the 3D animated straight to DVD movies from 2001 onwards. However, The Nutcracker was not Barbie's first foray into the world of the animated picture. And now, in her first full length music video adventure, here's Barbie in Out of This World! In 1987, the world was treated to Barbie and the Rockers Out of This World, a 2D animated 30 minute special intended as a pilot to a series that was never picked up. To say that this movie has a plot or character arcs would be fruitless. It doesn't. There's no conflict and Barbie's choices are all the right ones. Barbie is flawless and literally solves world peace by performing a concert in outer space in a space station shaped like a giant flower. It's insanely 80s, and any semblance of plot is there to segue between musical montages set to the most 80s tracks imaginable. It really is a wild little thing, with its 30 minute runtime giving the thing a frenetic pace which heightens the feeling of everything just kind of coming out of nowhere. I can't even really complain about it, and it's the perfect encapsulation of what a lot of the marketing for Greta Gerwig's Barbie is saying, with Barbie truly being everything and Ken just kind of being there. The World Peace Organization requests the pleasure of your company at a ball to be given in your honor as the first ambassador for World Peace. Oh my, what an honor. Anyway, onto the top half of the list now, with number 21 being Barbie and the 12 Dancing Princesses. This movie exemplifies a thing that this era of Barbie movies does quite frequently, which is that when dancing happens, what they mean really is twirling. A lot of twirling in this movie. The animal psychics are very annoying in this one, especially that fucking racist parrot. Fuck that parrot, and fuck whoever decided to give it that accent. On the other hand, Catherine O'Hara is in this one, which is an absolute slay. This one is absolutely classic BCU in everything it's doing, and it does a good job of doing that. It's just that there are ones I liked better than this one that are doing the same kind of stuff. Princes! They're out dancing with princes! Do you know what that means? <laughs> Number 20 is Barbie and the magic of Pegasus. Shiver is a liability, and I hate his constant thing. <laughs> Again, not the biggest fan of the animal sidekicks in these, though this is also a decent time to mention that a weird amount of these animal sidekicks are horny and give various other animal sidekicks fuck me eyes throughout the BCU. This movie is ice skating focused, which brings the BCU back to a more balletic place that has been missing for a few movies at this point. The finale ice skating dance sequence absolutely slaps. This movie does have the unfortunate quality of being a fetch quest movie, with the items to fetch being the most vague metaphorical bullshit imaginable, and for some reason Annika does not question these items in the slightest. From a measure of courage, a ring of love, and a gem of ice, lit by hope's eternal flame. That's only three things. It's all word association too, absolute nonsense. This movie does have a credits blooper reel though, so it gets points for that. Chase her, women chase me. Number 19 is Barbie, a fashion fairy tale. This is the movie that properly introduces the concept of Barbie being an actor within the BCU, playing characters in BCU movies within the BCU. There are so many layers in this universe, and if you try and understand the canon, you're going to struggle. And I did. In this movie, Barbie also gets cancelled. If this was made now, it would be painfully on the nose, but this was 2010, an innocent time. And by cancelled, I do mean that nothing really happened. In fact, she gets to direct the film at the end, so she she really just got a promotion at the end of the day. Also, Ken is an absolute brainless simp in this one, which is fun. There is not an ounce of common sense in that man's head. He said, it's over. If you're smart, you'll forget I exist. Well, uh, does Ken maybe speak another language where that means I love you? Number 18 is Barbie and her sisters in The Great Puppy Adventure. This is the last BCU movie to feature Kelly Sheridan as Barbie. She was such a staple of these movies for so long and really owned the role of Barbie that anyone else in that role just feels wrong somehow. It was sad to see her go. She did a great job and it was never the same without her. This one has a mystery adventure, Indiana Jones type vibe, which is a whole lot of fun. Once we get into the final act in the cave system, the music just goes full indie tilt and we get a classic rope bridge. I also do think that the scene with Taffy learning to be brave is very well done. There's plenty of power and it just works at an emotional level. Well done on making me, even briefly, care about these dogs. Move over. Puzzles are my thing. Number 17 is Barbie, a fairy secret. 
This one essentially acts as a continuation of a fashion fairy tale with the idea that Barbie is an actor within the BCU brought forward into this. Here, they're at a premiere for a new BCU movie within the BCU, and instead of actually telling you why this movie is where it is on the list, I'm just going to work out what this movie is. The only real clue we get as to what the movie is is a blurry poster in the background of some shots in the sequence. From this, the only information we can glean is that it's a predominantly fairy based movie. This fairy wears a pink dress, a gold crown, and that's all the information we have. The design of this poster most closely resembles the poster for Barbie Fairytopia Magic of the Rainbow, but even then, it's not that close. We can thus assume that this is a further Fairytopia franchise film that only the denizens of the BCU get to experience, with us mere mortals not getting the bibble that we deserve. Potentially, this may even be a movie that Barbie herself directed after the events of Fashion Fairy Tale bumped her up into a directorial role. Whatever the case, it doesn't matter. None of this is real, and this background poster is not interesting enough to have taken up this much time. Number 16 is Barbie, The Pearl Princess. This is a pretty nicely directed BCU movie generally, with some nice camera work and it just looks pretty great across the board. That a straight to DVD Barbie movie can look like this in 2014 is wild to me. This later era of the BCU doesn't get enough credit for actively looking pretty good a lot of the time. This one features a character who has a history of poisoning people who is hired by the villain to poison the king. This feels surprisingly dark for a Barbie movie, especially as this character is broadly sympathetic. But this is a franchise that, as we will get into higher in the list, features multiple instances of chemical weapons being used, so maybe a bit of poison is to be expected. Also, I love Fergus. He's just a little plant nerd and is unable to flirt in any other way than talk about his special interest. Relatable content. She thinks she can outsmart me. Unless that's just what she wants me to think. Number 15 is Barbie Fairytopia, Magic of the Rainbow our first Fairytopia trilogy movie on the list, which means it's probably time to talk Bibble. Bibble is our chaotic gremlin king. He speaks only in gibberish, is routinely utterly baffled, and sleeps in a sleeping cap like Scrooge. I love Bibble. That he manages to toe the line between being the most irritating creature alive and absolutely lovable is wild to me. In this one, he literally takes time to stop and smell the roses. We love an easily distracted king. Unfortunately, this movie does feature an updated bubble model, which is slightly more horrifying than previous models. This is especially exacerbated by this movie's tendency to favour close-ups far more than earlier BCU movies. This decision somewhat spoils Bibble in this movie for me, but not fully. He is still Bibble. I am, however, not a Dizzle fan. Go to bed! Number 14 is Barbie and the Secret Door. This one has princesses, fairies, mermaids, unicorns. It is the most Barbie movie to ever Barbie movie. That being said, it's always interesting to have a Barbie protagonist who isn't fully self-assured, with most Barbie protagonists having at least a decent level of confidence. Here, Alexa is predominantly concerned about failure and embarrassing herself to the degree that she is scared to put herself out there or fully commit to things like dancing for fear that she is bad at it. Letting kids see themselves and their insecurities reflected in a character like Barbie can only be a positive thing in my eyes. I also think the villain just being a spoilt brat is a lot of fun, with her villain song also being one of my favourites of the movie, probably just after the emotional slash bright pop mashup exposition song. I think that might be a controversial opinion, I imagine a lot of people find her annoying, but I had fun with her. Remember the story about the boy in the flying carpet? What's a carpet? What's a boy? Number 13 is Barbie as the Island Princess. This one is purely going to be a rant about Barbie costuming because the costuming in this one baffles me. Ro, for the bulk of the film, is outfitted in a plain white sheet. She does have a flower in her hair, but otherwise that's it. That's wild to me. This is a Barbie movie. Why is that her default look in this? Surely, at the very least, you would put some flowers up the middle or something. Just a little something, an accent, a splash of colour, anything to stop it from being the plain white sheet that it is. And it takes a full hour for her to change out of this outfit, and even that dress isn't all that inspiring. Hell, it doesn't even take that long for her to change back into the sheet either. Baffling decision. You could easily have had that basic island look be the flag she was found in, which would then be such an easy way to tie that iconography into the plot of the film, but no. 
weird, boring decisions abound. Aside from that, it's an alright movie, hence why it's so high. Number 12 is Barbie, Mariposa, and her butterfly fairy friends. This one opens with Bill going insane, making statues of his girlfriend and her friends. This guy is a maniac. I love him. Bill being this insane in the framing narrative is most of the reason this is so high. This movie does have a Bibble knockoff in Zinzi. Zinzi sucks. This is a Zinzi hate account. This movie is also very queer. I shipped Mariposa and Willa, then immediately switched sides when the villainous lesbian that is Henna entered the picture. A Mariposa ex Henna enemies to lover story is precisely what I want to see. Don't you think there are some things important enough to do, even if they're scary? Uh, no. Number 11 is Barbie. Rock and Royals. Despite being an avid high school musical fan, I have to apologize and say that I haven't seen Camp Rock. At least not since I was like seven anyway. Unfortunately, I don't think Camp Rock could hold a candle to this. This one's just fun. I obviously ship Courtney and Erica, and there's just a bunch of fun gags and things throughout just to make this an entertaining watch. I think the music is some of the better music in the BCU, which is good as this one is so music focused. This one was released during the peak of the Pitch Perfect franchise, and you can see that in stuff like When You're a Princess. And it works. I had fun. No, 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 no. Oh, sorry. Number 10 is Barbie in the Pink Shoes. This is the last proper ballet-centered Barbie movie released thus far, and feels like a nice send-off to the thing that so much of the early BCU was built upon. Putting Kristen into a mashup world of different ballets, and specifically including the big ones that the BCU had already adapted, just adds to this. It would have been nice if the characters were visually the same as their pre-existing BCU characters, just with updated models, but I'll take what I can get. In general, this one is well directed and choreographed. I really enjoy Kristen's more freeform ballet that goes off the prescribed choreography. I think it's also a decent message to send to kids that you do have to find enjoyment and find yourself in the things you're passionate about if you want to pursue them professionally or lose yourself and burn out. At the end of the day, it's dancing, and if you're not finding joy in it, what's the point? Hold on. I'm not getting married. I'm only 17. 17? Better late than never, my sweet. You don't look a day over 16. Number nine is Barbie, Fairytopia. That it feels controversial to put the original Fairytopia even this low on the list is frightening somehow. This is absolutely classic BCU energy throughout and obviously has Bibble, which is always a plus. I do think the movie's ambition does hold it back somewhat. It's trying to do so many things, take you all over this world. And at the end of the day, it's still only a direct to DVD movie from 2005. Trying to do all of these things, admirable as that may be, is a tall order for any production, let alone one as budget and time challenged as this. In places, it can look worse than other movies, simply because there was just so much they had to do. Also, I mentioned war crimes and chemical weapons earlier. That's Lavanda's plan here, unleashing an anti-flying fog over Fairytopia to prevent the fairies from stopping her. This will not be the last time she unleashes a chemical weapon on this world. Wild stuff. Number 8 is Barbie and the Three Musketeers. A predominantly action-oriented Barbie movie isn't really something I expected going into this, certainly an adaptation, even in name only, of the Three Musketeers wasn't something I anticipated, but here we are. And honestly, this one is a lot of fun. This one has it all. Women with swords, secret passageways, and some fun fake names. Lady Barbecue! Duchess Ivana Party! Abby Birthday! Countess Hedda Letters! It honestly feels quite Mask of Zorro esque, which is fun, although if this movie was going to crib from Mask of Zorro, it could at least have taken the wild cat roars when explosions happen. A fun drinking game with this one would be to take a shot every time Corinne says, I want to be a musketeer. And you will get nicely drunk off that. You see, the barbecue family comes from Italy, 
Uh, yes, as do our cousins, the pepperonis. Number seven is Barbie of Swan Lake. Having a unicorn that's giving Aquafina is a weird choice for your Swan Lake adaptation, I won't lie. I've mentioned the animal sidekicks a few times throughout this list, but I really do think here is a pretty good example of where they just feel a bit out of place and purely there because you have to have one. Hell, the unicorn model itself feels like it's out of a different art style, it just never really worked for me. Other than the unicorn, this is an absolute classic with some damn nice dance sequences in here as well. I really do appreciate that they took the time to get those dance sequences mocapped in these early ballet oriented films and it just results in the ones that don't feeling a bit off when they don't mocap it. Also, the final act body swap dance sequence is a lot of fun and I do not doubt for a second that this is where Edgar Wright really got his inspiration for the similar sequence in Last Night in Soho from. It's magic now. Number six is Barbie and the Diamond Castle. One of the gayest Barbie movies in the whole BCU, and that's saying a whole ass lot. You're telling me that Liana and Alexa are just two gal pal roommates who live in the most cottage core cottage, sing songs together and have a little farm shop. And then they end the movie having found a castle and two idiot men wanting to just return to their cottage and continue to live alone together. This one isn't subtle in the slightest. And I mentioned the idiot men there, and they really are, and I love that from them. Having them serenade the girls, and having them and their dogs visibly get the ick is nothing short of iconic, frankly. They have a real Thompson and Thompson from Tintin vibe to them, to be honest. This one really caught me off guard with how much fun it was. It wasn't really on my radar, and I was so pleasantly surprised by it. It's a fun one. How did you get to be so good look at genetics? Ah. Number five is Barbie, the princess and the pop star. That the BCU had the audacity to do another Prince and the Pauper adaptation after Princess and the Pauper is wild to me. As you can tell, it hasn't shown up on this ranking yet because it's just so, so good. So choosing to essentially do it again is a bold move. And whilst this doesn't live up to the highs of that one, this one is still fun. We have covers of Girls Just Wanna Have Fun and Perfect Day in here, which I have a lot of fun with, on top of the fact that the rest of the movie is generally pretty great for a BCU movie. Perfect Day is a song I kept getting reminded of hearing songs from earlier BCU movies, so I was so caught off guard when the actual song started playing in this one. That the BCU even got to a point where it was using actual licensed songs is wild to me. It licensed a couple of songs before this, but this movie is where they were most concentrated. And even then, it's only two pre-existing songs. The political commentary isn't incredible in this, nor is there any solution to anything even really offered beyond let the pause get to enjoy a free concert. But it's nice that there's even a slight attempt in here, I guess. I'm a for Jim. <laughs> Number four is Barbie, Starlight Adventure. For the longest time, I have wanted a proper sci-fi movie musical. It's just not a genre mashup that really exists. Turns out what I wanted was hiding in the BCU this entire time. It may not have the most musical numbers in the world, or even have most of that music be fully diegetic, but it's there. This is easily the best looking movie in the BCU for me. It genuinely looks consistently great, especially for a direct to DVD BCU movie. The environments are lush and full of detail, the character models look great, and the lighting is superb. I would usually have caveats to me calling BCU animation great, but I just don't with this one. Also, the little romance between Barbie and Sal Lee is lovely. Sure, it's not intentional, but when you have scenes of them flirtatiously bickering, dancing, and taking romantic hoverboard rides through the city to look out at the stars, there's no real way to take that other than romantically, honestly. Why are you defending her? You're a champion. She's not your equal. No, she's not. She's better. Number three is Barbie. Princess Charm School. I'm just gonna take this time to say how much I love Portia. I love characters who are too dumb to function. Give me those characters any day of the week. Give me your Britney S. Pierces. Give me your every character in Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mars. I love all of those guys. Gotta be one of my favorite character archetypes. So in lieu of review, this is a Portia from Princess Charm School out of context compilation. Is it nap time? How come nobody told me? You know what really bugs me, Portia? Yodeling hand puppets? You stole my cake! Not me. Blair! How dare she? You stepped on eight of my toes. I only have four left. 
Two. You have two left. That's even worse. The palace. Can you even imagine it? I grew up in the palace, Portia. I live there. Oh. But can you imagine it? I didn't know people made clothes. I thought they came from elves. You know, like toast. Number two is Barbie as the princess and the pauper. Martin Short as Preminger is probably the best casting decision the BCU ever made. He is giving this his all and is truly iconic. It's not even just Short that's giving him his all though, with the animators clearly having so much fun with him throughout. His villain song is also perfection on top of everything else. In general, the music is some of the best the BCU has to offer, with the soundtrack consisting of a surprisingly good number of absolute bangers. Hell, The Cat's Meow is a pretty great self-acceptance song, and it's about a cat that's trans. We have no choice but to stand. And on top of everything else in this movie slapping, we even have a blooper reel at the end of the credits because this movie already didn't slay enough. Will a week from today do? Ah! And finally, number one is, inevitably, Barbie Fairytopia Mermaidia. Of the Fairytopia trilogy, this movie easily contains the most iconic Bibble stuff, from him dancing over the opening credits, James Gunn, I see you taking notes, to him doggy paddling through the ocean, to his sexy voice when he eats that berry. Some absolutely incredible Bibble content throughout. We have more chemical warfare in this one, continuing the trend from the original Fairytopia, with Fungus Maximus using the same thing that was used to stop Godzilla in the original Godzilla. And then there's the biggest BCU ship in Elena and Nori. They are so very much in love, I will hear no opposing arguments to this. The waterfall scene? So damn sexually charged. The depths of despair? More like the depths of these two's love for each other. Hell, they get goddamn matching tattoos. It's just an absolutely iconic movie in every sense, and simply contains so much of the best stuff of the entire BCU. Great stuff. Bibble? What's a bibble? Mighty bibble! <laughs> so that's it. I did it. None of the information that I now possess is helpful to my life in the slightest. Hell, that the Barbie universe's version of Broccoli is called Broccolina isn't even referenced in Greta Gerwig's Barbie. None of this is. So what was all this for then, Greta? You're telling me that I wasted all this time for none of this to come up on your goddamn test. In all seriousness, I generally enjoyed the vast majority of these. There's a reason that the middle of this list is all pretty arbitrary in its placement, and that's because these movies are generally just pretty good. Of the 42 movies, I only actively disliked about six of them, and half of that was mostly just disinterest. Every other film had my attention and at least had stuff in there that I enjoyed in some capacity. Certainly the top 10 or so is the stuff I would properly recommend. There's some great stuff in there. Especially once you get into the top four. Those are films I would happily watch again, just maybe not anytime soon. If you are at all interested in seeing my real-time reactions to these movies, check out the description because my letterbox list will be down there and contains incoherent ramblings that resemble reviews, essentially extended versions of what I've said about the films on here. As I say, they're largely incoherent, but they are, you know, longer and contain more detail and more just little bits than I was willing to put into this already overlong video. So enjoy that, and do not do what I just did. Just go watch Greta Gerwig's Barbie. It's a lot of fun and is only one movie, not 42. <laughs> Delicious. Bibble? Well, hello, Barry. Don't you look lovely today? And you, aren't you the most luscious thing a branch ever saw? <laughs>